Thanks for joining us again on the Exploring Mining podcast. Today's interview is with Jonathan Odd, President and CEO of Dakota Gold. Dakota Gold trades on the NYSE American under the symbol DC. Dakota Gold is a South Dakota-based gold exploration and development company with a specific focus on revitalizing the home state district in Leeds, South Dakota. The Dakota Gold team is focused on the new gold discoveries and opportunities that build on the legacy of the home state district and its 145 years of gold mining history. In this podcast, we talk about the latest drill results from Maitland and Richmond Hill, macro trends, and why management and people are so important when looking at gold investments. For additional information, please visit dakotagoldcorp.com. This podcast may contain forward-looking statements. Investors are reminded to do their own due diligence and read all disclaimers and disclosures at the end of the show. Jonathan, thanks so much for joining us on the show. For listeners new to the story, can we just talk a little bit about the history of Dakota Gold and how you got involved? So we went public in in 2022, uh, merged the companies, rebranded it, rolled it back, changed the name, and came in with 50 million U.S. in capital. And this is essentially the third company born out of Barrick's closure group under the Mark Bristow-led Barrick, with the two other companies being Skeena and K92. One's got a billion-dollar mark cap, one's got a $2 billion mark cap. So what does it mean, a company born out of Barrick's closure group? So when Barrick bought Homestake in 2001, Barrick did not buy Homestake for South Dakota. So the mine was already in the process of being shut down. So when they bought it, it was basically in their closure group where it sat for 19 years. I approached Mark Bristow in, in uh, March of 2020, PDAC 2020, and pitched him this concept to acquire some of these assets out of their closure group. He was supportive. And that was really the basis for putting this whole company together. One of the deals we did with Barrick gave us exclusive access to 125 years of home stakes data. And that really informed this larger roll-up and consolidation of the home stake district, going from 5,000 acres to almost 50. And it really has helped inform our exploration program. You know, last week we came out with some drill holes that were, you know, really good, four and a half meters of 25 grams. Uh, on our Maitland project, which is contiguous with the old Homestake mine. And we sort of have a reclassification of the discovery, uh, in our, in what we call the JB zone, which is the same host, the same geology to the next door contiguous Homestake mine. Uh, we call it the Western Ledge Analog, which was 17, 19, and 21 ledges that were mined in the old Homestake mine. And we're, reclassifying our discovery into 34, 35, 36 ledge within the JB zone discovery area. And for those not familiar with the mine, these three ledges produced over 6 million ounces of gold at a little under 9 grams per ton. We think we're on to a significant new discovery right next door to the old mine. For investors that are maybe not as familiar with the home state district and South Dakota, can you just talk a little bit about the jurisdiction? Obviously, I think one of the things that stands out is that you're on private land and why that's all significant, clearly, uh, for permitting. Yeah, and my my last company that I, that I founded and was CEO of called Gold Standard, which was acquired by Orla, uh, you know, in the Carlin trend, on BLM ground, and of course, Nevada is supposed to be the best jurisdiction, arguably, in the world to be exploring and developing. Orla acquired Gold Standard Ventures for just under $300 million, and they're going to be roughly five and a half, maybe six years into getting a permit. And Orla, for those that don't know Orla, you know, arguably best in class, mid-tier producer, tier one management team, great shareholder list. Um, so, so you know, being on private ground is is by far the most advantageous from a permitting standpoint. You know, we do have BLM ground, we do have U.S. Forest Service, but everything we're doing right now, all four of these rigs are on private ground. Uh, we think that's just again hugely 
advantageous for us as we move uh, along and get to, you know, development, hopefully, you know, production. And South Dakota's got a great, highly skilled workforce. We've been able to draw on a lot of uh, ex home stake and, uh, you know, employees, people, and we also have partnerships with the South Dakota School of Mines uh, and, and uh, Black Hills University. So we're able to draw on a young, hungry uh, workforce. Uh, our head office is in Leeds, South Dakota. And from our head office to our Maitland project is a 10-minute drive. From our head office to our Richmond Hill project is about a 10-minute drive. So very close, very proximal. You know, it, it truly is a great jurisdiction to be operating in. Those are all fantastic things to take note of, especially after there were so many labor shortage issues in the last couple of years. That's good to hear. I wanted to talk, obviously, about your two main projects, Richmond Hill and Maitland property. Can you just talk to us about where they are compared to the old <laughs> barrack mine? And then, obviously, you come out with drill results on both, so I can just give us a little bit of an update on what's going on. Sure. So our Maitland project is actually contiguous with the old mine. Our kind of theory and our proof of concept was supported by data, but our, our proof of concept or theory was that there was mineralized homestake formation north, like coming north out of the old mine onto the Maitland project. And so homestake in the early 90s recognized that what they had was a finite resource and they started to look outside of the old mine and they made a discovery on the Maitland project called the North Drift Discovery in homestake formation. And if you go two and a half miles north of that, there's the old Maitland mine, which which contained a historical resource. Uh, so that drilling in the North Drift Discovery on the Maitland project by Homestake in the early 90s was all underground drilling. They did drill, uh, I think, six or seven holes from surface, and they hit mineralized Homestake formation in most of the drill holes. So we knew we had this deeper homestake mineralization, and then almost three miles to the north, shallow homestake formation. So our first discovery at Maitland on private ground was called Unionville, which was the name of the original claim back in 1876. And this is in tertiary epithermal. So it's a younger package of rocks, and, and it's this overprint that basically is is is, you know, on top or adjacent to or abuts the homestake formation. So with every drill hole we drill, we have an opportunity to hit both kinds of mineralization. This discovery we have made in our JB zone in the homestake formation is is something that is is a company maker. It's a significant new discovery, still very early days. Um, and and what we did and and why we have this. Uh, reclassification of the JB discovery, having these three distinct ledges within the JB zone, is we looked at 500 historical drill holes that Homestake drilled in the western ledge system, which was 17, 19, and 21 ledges, over 6 million ounces of gold, and we analyzed all of the drill data, average grade, average thickness, best gram meter intercepts in each ledge. And what we're drilling right now in our discovery is akin to that, is akin to that Western ledge system. Now, ultimately, what's in this 34, 35, 36 ledge within the JB zone could ultimately end up being smaller than what was in the Western ledge system, or it could end up being significantly larger. Still early days, we have a lot more pierce points to get in there, so that's really exciting. And then as you go to our Richmond Hill project, which is one mile to the west, also on private ground, we are coming out with a maiden resource, uh, and that will incorporate 800 historical drill holes and 50 holes that we have drilled. We've actually drilled, I think, 82 holes on the Richmond Hill project, and uh, only 50 of our holes have, you know, will make it into the resource. We're going to host a conference call, um, so that's super exciting. And there's a lot of opportunities for us to make it bigger and to expand upon it. And Richmond Hill is only one mile north of Wharf, which is owned and, you know, uh, operated by Coor Mining, and that's the state's only active gold mine. So 
This is one of the largest concentrations of gold anywhere on the planet. And I have to give uh, James Barry, our Vice President of Exploration, full credit for really um, spending the time on the geological model, on interpretation, and having both experience within the tertiary, which is the host at Wharf and Richmond Hill, and uh, the Homestake Formation being a part of, of, of Homestake Mining Corporation and working in the old mine. Well, it's uh, very exciting. I was reading one of your press releases and uh, the quote, uh, fully expect to find even better grade and additional ledges as drilling continues. You know, you don't see that very often. So <laughs> It's exciting to read that in a press release right now. <clears throat> I'm obviously maybe connecting the dots here, but obviously, when they're only a mile apart, is there the opportunity or looking forward into the future that the two projects on large project? You know, that's, that, that's a great comment. I mean, you know, part of this whole land consolidation that we've gone through, we've, we've, we've cleaned up a lot of that. So, look, I mean, there's, there's, we would need to start drilling in between the two for it to be one, one project. But, yeah, I think you can start to look at this, at this opportunity as a complex where you may have multiple deposits, you know, feeding a, you know, a central facility. But just one more comment about the JB discovery that we have in comparison to the Western Ledge system in the old mine. When Homestake was mining the Western Ledge system, they started mining the Western Ledge system at 3,200 feet below surface. We're hitting gold mineralization in our JB zone discovery at 800 feet below surface. So in that quote that you referenced in our press release, we do talk about yeah, there's there, there's a view that you know you could see thicker, higher grade portions of of this of this discovery as you go down depth, and that's something that we that we you know we we have to drill to get more confidence in that. But we're really excited about this discovery. And can you talk to us about um, your drill program for this year? Like so far, you have your two press releases out uh, on both projects, but um, what? Like how long are you going or how deep are you planning for this year? And just give us a little update on that. Yeah, so we're going to have these four rigs at Maitland for the next few months. And then we may look at, at moving one of those rigs over to Richmond Hill or adding a fifth and possibly even a sixth rig, you know, here. I think one of the things that Bob Quartermain brings to this company really kind of setting the tone is, is, is cadence and operating with conviction, passion and sense of urgency. You know, I, I think that's what everyone has really bought into. Um, so we're going to keep these, you know, at minimum four rigs going. The four rigs are going to really focus on the Maitland project. And again, once once I think we get through summer, we'll likely potentially move one of those rigs over to Richmond Hill or look at, at, at expanding the rig count there. You know, upcoming catalysts and milestones, we've got the maiden resource due for Richmond Hill late this month and then expect to see continued drill results from, from Maitland. And then you'll look at drilling resuming, you know, late summer into the fall at Richmond Hill as there is, you know, a number of low-lying fruit, you know, that's, you know, blocks of mineralization that, that only have one or two holes into it. There's a large silver endowment at Richmond Hill that will not make it into this resource. And there's a lot of opportunities for us on the Met side, a total of five breccia pipes, three of which have not been drilled. The other two have demonstrated an ability to make high grade. We hit, you know, 30 meters of six grams and the gold distribution is not confined to just the breccias. So that's very important for us. And we do have a number of earlier stage target opportunities supported by data from Homestake that we're going to look to drill. So I would say that, you know, five to 10% of our overall budget will be into pure grassroots earlier stage targets. Again, supported by, by Homestake data. So we're very focused. You know, this, this is this is a small area, like small footprint, but one that has amongst the largest concentration of gold anywhere on the planet. I wanted to jump in, and you've mentioned a couple of the people on your team. Talk to investors and our following about the team and everyone that you have on board. It's quite a wealth of experience that you have there. Bob Quartermain is, you know, we we had this private company. We founded it together. Not very original, but it, but it stands for Jonathan and Robert. You know, so we own collectively just under 20% of the company. Uh, our partners, uh, Jerry Aberly, 
who's the COO. He was the CEO of Dakota Territory Resource Corp. Uh, he was the last mine manager when Homestake shut down and was part of a local group that was trying to keep this mine open. Uh, born and raised in South Dakota. I think he's a second generation Homestake miner uh, and lives in Leeds. Other co-chair, Steve O'Rourke, uh, ran global exploration for BHP Petroleum for a number of years, C-Suite. He's very active, very supportive, and very passionate about exploring and developing safely and responsibly. You know, brought over Patrick Malone from, from Barrick. He ran their closure group. Uh, James Berry, vice president of exploration, uh, worked underground at Homestake, uh, and also worked for Warf Resources. And was vice president of exploration for Remarkable Minerals and really helped, well, not helped, put together that whole, you know, kind of district, did all the geological interpretation, and then ultimately, you know, sold to uh, Oceanic Gold for, you know, whatever, $750 million. So very talented explorer. And uh, CFO Sean Campbell was CFO for GT Gold, was also part of the treasury team that sold Wharf to Coor. When he was a Gold Corp. Um, and it's, you know, we've got a good, uh, shareholder base, you know, the largest shareholders, Orion Mine Finance, one of the largest mining private equity groups in the world. They were a big shareholder of mine at Gold Standard. And they gave Quartermain $600 million to build Bruce Jack for Predium, which he did and turned that into Canada's, uh, fourth largest gold mine. Fourth sale, Fidelity, CI, BlackRock. You know, Vanak, you know, we're in the, the GDXJ. We're also in the Russell 3000, which is rebalancing, uh, in June. You know, we're only two years old, but, uh, we feel this is, this is a significant discovery in, uh, one of the great gold districts in the U.S. And a lot of people don't know this, that Homestake, the Homestake mine is still the largest single gold mine in the history of the U.S. I did not know that either. <laughs> That I mean, that's a good company that you're keeping. So well done on that in two years. It's a lot of milestones achieved. I just wanted to quickly go over market cap, how many shares out, uh, what do you have as a till for investors that just want to hear? Sure. So we've got uh, roughly 86 million shares out. Uh, we've got uh, roughly $20 million in the bank. Um, as I said, management owns just under 25% of the company. And, um, we trade you know, around uh, 250,000 shares a day, although that's kind of picking up uh, more recently. So it is, I wouldn't call it a liquid stock, but I certainly wouldn't call it a stock that trades by appointment. You know, we're really excited about, about you know, that sort of the macro picture, you know, gold being where it is. There's still a disconnect. You're not seeing a lot of inflows yet into the gold funds. So I think that's what's part of, you know, this this opportunity and we've got a very catalyst-rich year for us in terms of, you know, the main resource at Richmond Hill, drilling results, you know, on a, on a new exciting discovery contiguous with a 40 million ounce ore body, which is still the largest single gold mine in the history of the U.S., but also, st- you know, it's, it's the largest ore body of its kind ever, um, which is this is a banded iron formation, you know, BIF. But yeah, we're 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 really figuring out the geology. I think this is going to be a good year for, for, for Dakota, supported by this macro, macro backdrop of, you know, higher gold prices, you know, potentially coming into a Fed pivot in the fall, an untenable debt situation in the U.S. And you're starting to see for the first time ever gold not being priced in London or New York. You're starting to see it get priced in the Middle East or in China. You know, I think there's also been a shortage of expiration and, you know, in investment overall in exploration. So there's a shortage of quality assets in good jurisdictions. I think we have an opportunity to be a company that, that, that's a lot of traction given, given where we are, given what we have, and, and quite frankly, given who's involved. What would you say to investors out there? Or what would be your advice or speculation for that, <clears throat> the exploration side? I find that it's been, it's kind of a disconnect. We do see gold running and we see all this translating into some of the bigger um, companies out there, but it seems at this point there's just not the same love for the exploration side as there used to be. So what what would you give as words of hope for, um, you know, the investors on the sidelines of why they should start taking a look again? 
Yeah, and that just comes down to appetite for risk, you know, tolerance for risk and, and timelines. But I think if you're to when you're looking at, at, at putting money into the gold space and however you want to have exposure to it. I mean if 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 it's physical or the ETFs or if you want to sharpshoot and own a bunch of producers and, and developers and explorers, it really starts with people. You know, do these people have a track record? You know, do they have any skin in the game? Have they had any commercial successes? Do they think like an owner? Um, you know, I, I think when it comes to putting money in exploration companies, I own, you know, a lot of, you know, I, I'm, I'm way overweight gold and I have been for, for a long time. <laughs> um, and it's, it, it, it's people. You know, if I am coming in as an investor and I'm putting more money in than management, that's not good. So, you know, if you start there, you're, you're going to be able to avoid a lot of headaches, a lot of losses. Um, and again, mining is a tough business, you know, from, from interpreting the geology, metallurgy, permitting, country risk, capital markets, the commodity price. What's the Fed going to do? There's a lot of things that can go wrong. And usually when, you know, in the life cycle of, you know, from discovery to development to production, most of those things usually do go wrong or go against you. So, you know, it's it's a cyclical business. It's a long-term business. And I think that there's there's a, you know, uh, a dramatic repricing in, in, in gold that's going on. I think it's really exciting. But 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 again, if you do not have any exposure to gold and you want to have exposure to gold, um, you need to figure out what kind of exposure you want to gold. What kind of investor are you? Because uh, some of these gold stories, whether you're uh, a producer, a mid-tier developer and explorer, have risk. And, you know, when you're looking at these companies, look at how much management owns. And if you're investing in a newer story, Look what the cost base is for management. I mean, if, if they're getting in at one penny, I don't really want to support that. If they're getting in at one penny and then, you know, six weeks later I'm getting in at 40 cents, well, that's not really fair, is it? Again, skin in the game, having that alignment is is really, really important. You know, again, if, if, if you listen to someone like Rick Rule, who's, you know, a titan in the space, he has so much experience, Extremely successful, very wealthy, and, and someone who's versed in, in multiple commodities across so many cycles. It, it people. He's like, I would be infinitely wealthier if I just invested in five or six people over the course of my career. And those people being, you know, the Lundin family, you know, Friedland, um, McEwen, Quartermain, Ross Beatty, you know, people like that that are, that are just uber successful at whatever they do. And it's been such a great honor for me to partner with Bob Quartermain and learn from him and grow with him. You know, he's he's an inspiration to work with. And um, there's a reason why he's in the Mining Hall of Fame. Oh, I love that answer. That's probably one of the best answers I've had on the podcast so far. <laughs> so, well done. I want to come up to wrapping things up. Uh, 2023 was obviously a challenge for every mining company, I think, out there. Just wanted to, on a personal level, what what did you see as some of the challenges? What did you learn, and what are you looking forward to most in 2024? You know, the latter half of 23 and into Q1 of 24 was, you know, for me probably the the toughest six to nine month period I've ever had, of, and, and I've been in the market for 24 years now. It was a challenge because there was just outflows, outflows, redemptions, selling, and, and selling into what? There was no bid. And so a lot of these stocks were down 50, 60, 70, 80%. So again, just understanding this market, having a long-term view, uh, having access to capital, and it's very easy to get discouraged. And you just, you, 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 you've got to just look long-term. You know, the challenging, frustrating part was, you know, gold wasn't at 1200. It was, it was, you know, 15, 1800, 2000. And that was the disconnect. And just, you, you typically, you know, wouldn't see those kinds of, of, of outflows or redemptions in a strong gold price environment. And, you know, still seeing all kinds of mixed economic data. And we're coming into this really interesting inflection point. You know, you, you, 
it's so unsustainable to have two and a half to three trillion dollars annually in deficits for a trillion dollars to be spent on military, for a trillion dollars to be spent to service your debt. So at some point that's not sustainable. And then the other interesting thing that's going on is is you've got this massive de-dollarization happening where when Russia invaded Ukraine, the U.S. gave the world a bit of a playbook for what happens when you go against U- U.S. foreign policy. You know, sanctions, seizing assets. But if a, comp- if a country has physical gold stored in their own country, someone else can't take that. So I think that's part of what's going on here. And for me, it's just, you know, kind of head down, you know, be humble, you know, push the team, have alignment, communicate with your shareholders. Don't hide when it's a bad market. I mean, sure, fund managers hate that. You know, when it comes to redemptions, you know, just hopefully the fund managers, you know, do so in a way that, that is not hurtful to stock or too hurtful or damaging. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's a lot of lessons learned, but again, History never repeats itself, but it rhymes. And you go through enough of these, it doesn't make it easier, but you sort of, their characteristics, their, their markers about, you know, when things are feeling like they're starting to turn. For me, one of the major markers for turning points and inflection points is when you see capitulative redemption based selling and when you have a cluster of them. And you saw that. You saw that in Q4, you saw that in Q1. Yeah, so that's I could probably talk for days about this stuff, but um <laughs> I know you've got you've got other things and more important people to talk to. So so um um that's that's kinda you know, was, was my view of, of the tail end of this of this downturn and, and what two thousand twenty three was all about. But it really set the platform up for us to be successful. And we raised money in October with, with Orion and they came in and bought a seven and a half percent stake in the company. And we wanted to have partnerships with with a group like Orion that has a long term view. It's a, it, it, it you know their partnerships are ten year closed funds, so you're not going to have redemptions with other open ended active gold funds. So it was important for us to get those guys in and, and onto the registry. Well, Jonathan, you've been a wealth of information. Your property's uh, fantastic. It's an exciting story. I think everything. As far as if I was an investor, that you have everything I could possibly want in the deal. So where can investors reach out to your team? Are you going to be at any of the conferences coming up? I know you said that you're going to have your webinar coming up as well, but uh, just give them kind of a little overview of where they can reach out and connect. Yeah. Um, so I'm a little different. I mean, I'll talk to any shareholder. I don't care if you own a 1,000 shares or a million shares. I, I, I try to treat every shareholder as equals. So I, I encourage people to reach out to me directly. And, uh, we also have a, you know, a great website. That's a, that's a phenomenal resource. Um, so it's dakotagoldcorp.com. Uh, all of my contact information is on our website. Again, I highly encourage people who have questions. And, you know, many years ago, you know, when I was starting out in the business and you'd ask somebody a question, those that took the time to help out someone that was trying to educate themselves, I'm still close to those people today. People that would say, oh, I'm busy, piss off. I don't speak to those people today. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, you know, when you're starting out, I mean, you can learn so much and you can avoid a lot of mistakes by by asking people who have been through the business and have had success. So, I mean, I highly encourage people to to reach out and, and we will be putting on a press release outlining um, you know, the, the, the details for Richmond Hill Resource. And I would encourage everyone that has an interest in what we're doing to, to dial in. It might be challenging for everyone to ask a question, but, um, you know, reach out to me directly via email, text me, and, uh, we'll be more than happy to, you know, to, to, to tell you more about Dakota or share some of my experiences, both good and bad in, in the resource space. I love that, Jonathan. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. This is uh, fantastic. Thank you so much. 
that does it for today's Exploring Mining podcast. If you'd like to be a guest or sponsor for this podcast, please contact InvestorIdeas.com. InvestorIdeas.com reminds all listeners to read our disclaimers and disclosures on the InvestorIdeas.com website. All investment involves risk, and this podcast is not meant to be an endorsement to buy or sell securities or products. To hear more podcasts, you can go to InvestorIdeas.com slash audio. And a reminder, you can also hear our podcasts on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play Music, iHeart.com, TuneIn, Stitcher, Spreaker, and SoundCloud. 